Hi, Noah. Welcome to Movie Junk. How are you? Yeah, I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for having me, man. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have a very special guest joining us today and Noah Danby, who fans from the Chucky series know as Teddy. We've also seen you star in many, many films, uh, some to mention like Tuxedo, My Spy, Riddick, Rocky Marciano, and many, many prominent TV series over the years. I can't thank you enough for joining us today. Brother, that's blast from the past right there. Marciano with John Favreau, uh, George C. Scott, Judd Hirsch, Penelope Ann Miller. They were all in that. That was my very first movie. And <laughs> I wish I had known more going into that project. But it's so funny you bring that up. I'm just like, oh, wow. I was thinking about that the other day. But anyway, yeah. So, so great to be here. I'm sure this is going to be a trip down memory lane. I'm so happy to share that with you. Amazing, amazing. And I, I do want to jump into Rocky Marciano, but because this is your first time being on our show, I do I don't want to do our fans a disservice because I do want to learn a little bit about the journey, sort of what got you started in the business. Because I know Rocky Marciano was one of your first or early projects, but prior to that, what even got you interested in wanting to get into the business? Yeah, I guess, you know, it all stems. I grew up in a, in a family that was pretty, pretty heavily immersed in the arts. My father was a, a world-renowned uh, uh, painter, um, realist. Um, his name was Ken Danby, if you, if you ever get a chance to look him up. So uh, the arts were always very important. He did a little TED Talk that is it's worth the... Uh, should, I'll send you the link and you can maybe even post it up. Um, and he talks about the importance of arts and society. So I grew up that sort of backbone in my belief system. Um, so for me to present that to my parents... That I wanted to be an actor, you know. Um, at first, I was involved in in the arts program at my school, uh, and I got a lot of accolades. And you know, if you receive that sort of encouragement at a younger age, it's you pursue more and more and more, and more awards and so on. And um, I was always encouraged to go the route of a conservatory, so I went on to do that, and. Uh, right out of the starting gates out of school out of university i i was involved in summer stock theater and uh i booked a couple of tv shows and then i booked um i think it was marcy yeah marciana was the very first movie that i i booked and I, it and it was one of the first auditions i had but the booking took quite a while it took a couple of maybe a month and a half and then boom i had this role and so i was doing the theater, doing this movie, which was directed by Charles Winkler, Erwin Winkler's son. It had Penelope Ann Miller, Judd, uh, Judd Hirsch, uh, John Favreau, obviously, playing Marciano. Uh, and, and I got to share the screen with George C. Scott, the late, great George C. Scott. who was Legend. And I had an appreciation back then for him, uh, but now, through my eyes, 2020 is hindsight, like looking back, it's oh, I wish I had asked so many more questions. But yeah, he was uh, he was a really cool dude. It was awesome. What a great experience. Oh, and uh, who was the stunt coordinator on that? Uh, I can picture his face. Uh, he he coordinated Rocky One Two. Uh, uh, it'll come to me later on. Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, the boxer with uh, actually, you know, he did the boxer. You got to look him up if you can. The stunt coordinator on Rocky One and Two. And he did um, he did the boxer. He walked out. He told me a story when he was walking on uh, when he was working on the boxer with uh, Daniel Day Lewis. That Daniel was like just wanted to box for real, and and he was like, "What the fuck do you have me here for? What do you need me?" And they flew him back home. And I was at uh, it'll come to me. Uh, and for for the fans that don't know, so Charles Winkler directed right. He's the son of Erwin Winkler, who, who directed made- Rocky. Or Erwin yeah. Winkler and, and Robert Chardoff, you know, produced. Um, yes, uh, right. Or right. Robert Chardoff, you know, passed away. He was a part, but now Erwin Winkler and Charles Winkler. And I even think uh, Robert Chardoff's son is also part of it too. But these are the folks that produced all the Rocky movies and the current Creed movies as well too. So, uh, I mean, was there, obviously, I mean, this is in one of your early roles, right? But was there any added pressure knowing that you're semi getting into the world by the folks that made Rocky and you're in a boxing movie? Yeah, it was, it was, I mean, I, I didn't, the weight of it for me was simply that I grew up watching Rocky movies. I knew these boys had a, a, a quite a big hand in that. 
and that I was now a part of this team. It was a much smaller scale, but at the same time, the weight of having all these names and having those boys attached, for me, I, I literally, like I had, I was, um, a lot of my stuff was was boxing. I, I had the big, I would play Carmine Vingo, the big Italian out of Chicago, or sorry, New York. And, uh, and Marciano was out of Chicago and they, these two Italians met. And my character ended up uh, getting beaten by Marciano badly uh, and, and almost in a malicious way. And then Marciano felt very bad about that mm-hmm. and ended up taking care of Carmine Vingo for the rest of his life. They became friends afterwards. Very, very good friends. But because like Marciano literally gave him brain damage yeah, to an extent where he had full functions of his faculties, but he was just a little slower on the draw and could never box again. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So that was that. Anyway, um, and so that was, that was, I'm not sure if that really got explained in the film because it did have me show up later on. Anyway, the point of this being like, I had these, this, these great scenes with George C. Scott, which I'm not sure they made the final cut. It's been a while, but I remember George C. Scott grabbing me and, and I was walking him across and I was shh, shaking. <laughs> I was like, holy shit, this is George C. Scott. <laughs> and and I know we briefly um, you know, discussed this, you know, prior to uh, to going live on the uh, podcast, but you also have a uh, a mixed martial arts background. Uh you also have a wrestling background as well, too. Was that easy to sort of transition into a boxer as well, too? Because you're also in amazing shape. Like you look like a legitimate boxer in this film, right? So, like, was it hard to sort of prep for this role or was it easy for you? Uh no, I, w- I mean, physically, it was easy. Um, my boxing skills were not up to par for that movie. I mean, especially looking back, but it is what it is. I, I could throw. I was a scrappy young man back then. And I was a, I was a really keen on Greco-Roman freestyle wrestling at that point in my life. And I had gotten into martial arts. Hapkido with a guy up here named Grandmaster Wong Inshik who ended up teaching Jackie Chan at some point along the line and a few of those other uh, Golden Harvest boys. He was the real deal. Um, But to get in shape for Marciano, I I was already in shape. A a lot of the stuff that comes to Canada or Toronto, for that matter, it's a quick cast. I'm the guy, especially at that point in my career, you had to be the guy who was already in shape and already capable to do the role. And they come in and it's not like you got two months to prep that a lot of guys would do or get. Um, uh, no, you had to be ready to go. And next week we're shooting or Friday we're, we're, we're starting to shoot. So wardrobe tomorrow, get the ball rolling right away. So yeah, that's, that was the case. And in, in, in for that movie, they, they had been trying to find somebody. And part of the reason is they have to justify, you know, do we bring somebody in from the States or do we use somebody local the tax breaks local are really great. This is all part and parcel to to anywhere, to any any sort of runaway production from L.A. You go shoot in Utah, you go shoot in New York, you go shoot in Texas, you go shoot in Louisiana. You get tax breaks for you can, using local actors, and then you go to Canada, you get better tax breaks even uh, for using someone who's Canadian. Even better tax breaks if you hire somebody who, if you're shooting in Toronto, shoot a local Torontonian and you're not putting them up. You're not flying them across the country, yada, yada, yada. So for me, I was in, sorry, that's a long winded answer, but it explains a lot of way the business works. Um, I, I, I was in back then I was in, I was so disciplined. I was working out twice a day, um, doing the play um that was touring and then driving down to do the movie the next morning on three hours sleep i don't know how i did it but it was uh it was good it was a rush it was awesome and then the fight scenes which lasted uh the fight scenes were incredible in that movie we yep. shot in a big auditorium with big crowds and 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 so on and so forth and jim nickerson that's the name of the stunt coordinator <laughs> jim nickerson, jim nickerson. His golden rule when I was fighting John Favreau was, all right, son, here's the rules. He can he, he can hit you, but you can't hit him. I was like, all right. Yeah, <laughs> John, up his face, yeah. Yeah, John, John was very good. He uh 
He laid it in a few times, but he pulled his punches. He was really good. He was a great actor and he did a great job in that film. Um, and I only walked away with a few bumps and bruises. Yeah. And I mean, also too, like, you know, this was still, you know, John, John Favreau had had, you know, quite a few projects, but it was still early in his uh, career, right? We'd already gotten um, Swingers. I believe this was before Made, but I remember him obviously in Rudy, right? And his transformation of his body to look like Rocky Marciano was was amazing too. And I was just impressed with, you know, how good he did, you know, as a, you know, how believable he was as a boxer. And obviously now he's a great filmmaker, right? He's making, you know, some of the biggest movies in Hollywood right now and, and pretty much, you know, steering the, the ship for Star Wars um, too. So it's just amazing sort of, you know, his... Um, you know, filmmaking capabilities as well. But what was it like sort of in the ring? Like, were you guys giving each other, were you giving him advice because you have more of the fighting background or did he sort of have a vision or like, what was that like? No, Jim, it was all Jim. And he was by the numbers, Jim Nickerson. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and he, we rehearsed quite a bit. And uh, John was great. He picked it up. I mean, he wasn't always in the rehearsals. I think we rehearsed a couple of times together and that was that. The rest was just me and other stunt stunt guys. But John picked it up well. He got in sick shape for that. Like he had he had a six pack. Yeah. He was he was in phenomenal shape. I mean, he's a big guy. Yeah. Normally he carries around a little bit of weight naturally. For me, it was I've always been ath athletic and always done that. And I've had to maintain that throughout my entire career. Um, but John, even back then as a young guy, I remember um you got to understand, I came from a theater background where when you enter a theater space, you walk in, everyone's happy, everybody's so welcoming, and you're there to risk and share and get to know one another. And it's it, it's just this amazing sort of family that you form when you do a, a theater production. Um, and that's all part and parcel. You got to carry that over into film but you don't, you don't have that back and forth really in film. It's, it's like you show up, do your job, be ready to do your job. And then um, again, all this to say that for me, John, John was really cool. He, he carried me through that match. Um, and he, he owned that character. Uh, and so for me to observe that and carry on that sort of uh, lessened, into other projects afterwards was was key for me and my growth. John was on another level, and uh, it was it was great to be a part of that. Amazing, amazing, and um, I do want to jump into the Chucky series because we're coming off of Halloween yeah. season. That's right. And you know what? What better series or show or movie to talk about than Chucky? Right. So. Um, we did get so the way that the season, the season three was broken down is we got the first four episodes, um, you know, during the Halloween season and the next four are going to come out, um, I believe, during spring of next year or early next year. So um, we did get and it, I think this is probably even though these are four episodes that we got the most bloodiest out of all the previous two seasons. Right. And we're in the White House. We get Devin Sawa returning as the president, right? This is the third time he's back as a different character. Um, we get to meet your character. You are the loving Secret Service agent, Teddy, who we all fell in love with. And, you know, spoilers, you know, I'm pretty sure fans have already seen the show to this point, you know, met his demise uh, by Chucky. Um, previous to, to joining this show, um, were you a fan of the Chucky series before joining? Yeah, I mean, I, I listen. I watched Chucky when I was a lot younger, and um, and so I was I was obviously familiar with Chucky, and I always got a kick out of him. And I love genre films, so I'm I'm not uh, I'm not a snob by any means. You know, a lot of snobs don't. I call them snobs because they don't like genre films, and uh, you know, I, Army of Darkness and and all those flicks. Like they're just they were a part of my youth, and I and I've carried it through. And I've noticed that there's a real sort of you play the course you're on type attitude when you, you enter in on a project, especially up here again, like when projects come in, you don't really get stereotyped so much. You have to be able to adapt to the project that's come to town and Chucky came to town. And so, you know, I was like, oh yeah, I know Chucky, of course. And a lot of the time we don't get, we don't know what we're auditioning for, by the way. 
So the working title, maybe I'm telling too much, but I'm sure it doesn't matter. Um, the working title for this project is Forever Young. So we get the sides. The project's called Forever Young. And we're like, okay, what is this? And you can kind of piece it together. I'm like, oh my God, this doll's killing people. This is like Chucky. Oh. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. then, and so that, <laughs> excuse me. And then I tell my agent, he's like, well, yeah, it is Chucky, but please don't tell anybody and so on and so forth. I'm like, oh. So it's nice to know what you're working with and on when you're auditioning. But, you know, when I got the role, uh, Don was really nice. And, and he said, like, there was just something about the way you read, which was very caring, very fatherly. And uh, it's what we were looking for, exactly what we were looking for. I said, OK, thanks. It's awesome. I'm glad to be a part of it. And then from there, we went, we did some training for uh, like uh, high profile, uh, like presidential security training, which was really cool. It's always nice to get that opportunity to practice what you're doing and get everybody on the same page. And then we had our team of, of players and, you know, one time, you know, for takes, you might do something offside and you can call somebody on, hey, remember we did this and they're like, oh yeah. And then they might do the same for me. Oh, you might want not, you might not want to do that, Noah, because you know, you have to do this. You have to, I'm like, right. Jackets have to be open. There's the one scene where I'm walking with uh, Callum and I'm walking as he's getting into school and we couldn't close our jackets because you can't close your jackets because the, um, you have to have access to your gun if you need to get to it. But the wind was blowing so badly that day that my jacket was blowing open. It was blowing all over the place. And they're like, Noah, can you do anything? Like, do you want us to tape it down? And I'm just like, no, go. I'll just hold it like this. <laughs> so it kind of looked funny to me when, when I was walking and holding my jacket like this. But it's because the wind was going so crazy and yada, yada, yada. Anyway. Uh, so, yeah, I'm blabbing. But Yeah, I don't, I don't know if you know this statistic, right? But I believe your character is the only character to get shot by Chucky on screen. So oh, Chucky, Chucky really? and, and please, if anyone wants to correct me, please correct me. But from my understanding, you're the only character that's been shot. That's why, I mean, I, I've seen Chucky, I'm not seeing, but I mean, in the movies, Chucky kills people all the time. But when your character got shot, it was very surprising. I was like, I don't think I've ever seen Chucky shoot anybody before. It was very like, out of nowhere right and he's killed people with a gun before but it's always off screen you'll see the body laying down with a bullet hole but we've never seen the shots so that was something that was really unique i believe you're the first character to actually get shot by chucky you're you're among uh, you know a very unique uh, class of uh, chucky kills very cool yeah and i remember <laughs> i remember how happy they were when i did get shot and um so funny whenever a character dies in a series there's always this sort of reverence to the character on this show when we go in uh there's a big setup they're like okay guys we have firearms on set today everybody's called everybody's there for the meeting and then and then the uh the first ad called out all right today's the first death on chucky season three and everybody in the crew erupts and i'm just like what is this <laughs> usually it's like you know hey sorry your character's gone which anyway you'll see there's more to teddy than meets the eye definitely right uh, oh i'm sorry go ahead Doug. yeah no 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 i think you know what i'm about to say and probably shouldn't say so i will continue maybe maybe our minds were thinking like i was just gonna say right so it could be one of two things um We've seen characters get killed off and return. Um, That's right. Yeah. Characters. Um, we've also seen, uh, like, for example, we just recently interviewed um, Annie Briggs, um, who plays the uh, the teacher and the guardian uh, of the kids. And when we when I interviewed her, um, her character hadn't uh, died yet, right? But I said, you know, because we're whenever we start warming up to a character and start getting attached to a character usually it means the character is going to meet their demise uh soon and then lo and behold the next episode you know she um she was strangled I believe, by chucky and it was just sad right but then we did see her character return the next episode in a flashback 
as well too so maybe we could also see your character return in a flash yeah you, yeah you it wasn't the last time you'll see teddy i'm sure i can say that that's just fine um there was this one thing when when i was doing that death scene a lot of the times they have a uh, they have different chucky dolls i don't know if you know this have you the, 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 have you talked about this like there's there's dolls they use on set uh like like it's almost like a stunt doll and then they have the real thing the real doll and then they have the doll when he transforms and he's the killer and then they have the puppet the puppeteer doll which is controlled by um you have one guy working the feet one guy's got the body one guy's on the hands and then another guy is is robotically working the face off of off camera and his name is um, frank something or other I believe and he's from the henson school wow so he's this guy's old school he's and i think he's from from the beginning of chucky he's worked with him he or has been <laughs> working chucky he is chucky to an extent and uh i got to uh i got to meet him and pro pick his brain a little bit and uh just saying how thrilled i was to to be a part of this sort of uh i don't know this the sort of golden age of things that has this long lineage of really exciting, talented people involved with it. It's re it, it, it really is. Um, it, it has a massive following, right? So you have to give the devil his due. <laughs> definitely, definitely. And for me, I mean, right, I've, I've been a fan, you know, I'm, I was born in 88, right? So the first Chucky movie um, I have pictures of me, you know, at like one, two, already watching the first Chucky. So I was already seeing the first Chucky by the time the third one came out, you know, I believe that was 90 and then either 91. I was watching all the first three uh, Chucky movies as a, as a baby, right? So I don't know, you know, um, it was me, you know, sort of sneaking away and, you know, being able to, to get these movies from the, uh, the rental store, but a huge fan of the, of the uh, series since conception and just seeing how, it's still alive and still ticking to this day, right? And when, who more to thank than than Don Mancini? Because um, for me, when I first heard that they were making a, a Chucky series, to be honest, I was like, how are they going to make this work on TV with the way Chucky is and the swearing and the killing? But we've gotten so much more because it's a series because we're getting, you know, um, you know, multiple episodes where we can do so much more versus in a movie, we might be more limited. So it's just simply amazing what's being done. So I know you like The Sopranos. And now you've told me you really like you like Chucky. Do you like a, a lot of other like um, genre films? Is that is that sort of your your thing or? Uh, you like Rocky, like you've, you've had Frank Stallone on your show Uh you really gravitate toward the Italian, uh, New York, Philadelphia, East coast vibe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I mean, for me, it's, it's funny. Like my, uh, dictionary database of movies is like from 1970 to 1999. I can recite and name and movies and have like a good database. And then after that, it kind of gets sporadic every year of some of the movies that I choose. But yeah, I mean, just kind of growing up, you know, a lot of, um, you know, my, uh, you know, close circle, like how we would, you know, uh, have time or, or in our hobbies would be to do movie trivia or to just name, you know, like movies that a specific actor was in. That's how we would kill time or spend time on road trips. So, yeah, I mean, I have a pretty diverse base of movies that I like, but for some reason, the Italian culture um, has really sort of been, you know, whether it's, you know, Stallone uh, or some of the mob genre uh, clips um, have really sort of been uh, kind of like Sorry, my, the what the the, like the mob, the oh, mob. The mob. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, have really been uh, a good uh, focus of mine, but I, I, I honestly, I'm, I'm a fan of, uh, um, of just good, you know, talent, good story. Sometimes the simplest projects, you know, can really, really uh, grab your attention. So, um, yeah, I'm just a, a sucker for, uh, for a good story. Do you like action films, or is it, is it more? Yeah, so that's going to go into a whole other discussion. So, like Seagal, Van Dam. Um, you know, the uh, like the double impact blood sport kickboxer movies. Uh, we just recently interviewed uh, Muhammad Kisi, who was Tong Po um, and kickboxer. Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So, yeah, love, love. He has a brother, right? He, his brother is uh, Abdul. He and his brother came with Van Damme to L.A. 
right? Am I not? Am I not? Yes. Not so, so there's uh, Muhammad Kisi, who's Tong Po, who was also in Bloodsport, who was also in Lionheart, but the villain in Lionheart was um, Attila, uh, Abdul Kisi. So right, his brother. It was Muhammad and Van Dam that came to L.A. Abdul is the older brother. He came afterwards. So his first movie was Lionheart. So when they were auditioning for Lionheart, it was Muhammad that said, hey, my brother would be good for this part. And that's when he came and started uh, getting into Hollywood. Do you know that movie was was not called Lionheart abroad in the States and Canada? It was Lionheart abroad. It had a different title. Do you know what the title was? No, no, I don't. Uh, it was called Wrong Bet. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember that point in the movie? Line. Yeah, that's what it was. Bet. Wrong bet. That's what the name of the movie was, at least in Holland. My friend who's who's Dutch was uh he's like, oh I kept saying Lionheart. He's like, Lionheart. I was like, he goes, You mean wrong bet? You know like, what? I, I didn't know that. I'm I'm disappointed for not knowing that. Uh, because especially that's the part where he's like, This guy's gonna kill your ass, don't you know that? <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's yeah. Awesome. Yeah, like for me, my favorite Van Damme movie is uh, is Double Impact. But for my cousin, for him and a few of my cousins, it's Lionheart. So we go back and forth uh, between those. So like, yeah, Lionheart is just, uh, um, I just actually watched it uh, yesterday. I actually pulled out the uh, the old DVD and put it on. Yeah, Van Damme, we all, I remember in high school for us, Bloodsport was, uh, was so, and the kickboxer, I used to love Double Impact when he would come in and go express service <laughs> and then do his dance that he does, <laughs> this man dance does. But I really liked, and it was cheesy, man, but I really liked The Quest. The Quest was really good. Yeah, and it was almost Lionheart, but just dated prior. Att Attila was in The Quest also. Uh, his the, the Attila character was, he was bald though in this movie. If I'm not that's right. Yeah, that's he right. He was bald in this movie. Yeah, I think the quest was like, and then he started being in, um, he had smaller scenes, like he was also in The Order as well. Um, I, that was one of the last, I think, straight to DVD movies, The Quest. It may have had a, a limited theatrical release, but that one was really, really good. And then Van Damme's done some sporadic projects. Like I like JCVD. That was good. And he came he back. He breaks the fourth wall and goes up into the rafters. My heart breaks for that guy. Mm -hmm, he mm -hmm. just lets it pour out and then yeah. boom, comes back down and gets into it it's it's a good flick for sure and he was awesome in the expendables too the second expendables movie that's I like right that um, yeah. I, I don't know if you know but um you know now just jumping into action um they're also some of these old 80s guys are rounding up and um, they just shot a, a movie called the last kumite which is coming out next year. And it's got um, Matthias Hughes, um, who's been on our show a few times. He was in I Come in Peace with Dolph Lundgren. Um, ah, the actor, yeah. from No Retreat, No Surrender. I forget his name, Kurt. He was the, the good guy in No Retreat, No Surrender. And um, just all these 80s guys kind of rounded up. And it was spearheaded by just having a conversation like this. A podcaster was having an interview with uh, Matthias Hughes and then suggested, hey, man, you're a fan of the genre. Why don't you go and make... Uh, this movie and um, he did and I'm excited to see that project it's got oh, a wow. story very cool yeah he was uh, he was something else he might he looks like he's a big fella too Matthias Hughes yeah oh he's big he's big I mean do, do you remember I Come in Peace pretty of well of course yeah so, yeah so he was towering over Dolph Lundgren uh, well, you never know, right? Because you got Hulk Hogan in Rocky Three. <laughs> I mean, I know Hulk Hogan's a tall guy, but they they put him on boxes. You never know how tall somebody actually is. He admitted that they're almost the same height. He was wearing boots. That's uh, see, yeah. Hilarious. He goes. He was wearing boots, and what was crazy is that during these uh, scenes, I don't know if you remember the part where he's uh, running over the cars to get to the uh, good alien. He's running over the cars. That was all him, and he was in the boots. He said he was. That was a very dangerous scene that he did um, wearing those boots. He never took them off. Well, good for him. Good for him. Amazing, amazing. And um, so it sounds like you know. Again, there's a just reverting back to to Chucky. So it sounds like there might be more of Teddy in the future. But you know, no spoilers here. Um, yeah. 
didn't ask um was there a favorite chucky movie that you had growing up i mean the first one for me uh the bride of chucky <laughs> i remember that one too we're talking this is going back man mm -hmm. so um uh who played the bride uh her jennifer name tilly yeah of course jennifer tilly like having her involved that was sort of emasculating chucky i was like bitch <laughs> but she's amazing you know what I mean? Chucky's all of a sudden the hero in this movie because all of a sudden he's being pushed down <laughs> and you you want the bad guy to win now. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Anyway. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, I mean, um, she, and she, and I, I've seen some of her interviews as well too because like obviously her character is also, you know, getting older as well too, but she's just still looking so stunning, you know, playing the role so well. And um, yeah, I know for she's also bringing a lot of the comedy element to the show as well, too. Right. Some of the deaths that she's involved in are, are silly. Right. And, you know, she's in jail and we're sort of starting to see now, you know, some of the manipulation that she's doing and, and how she's going to eventually um, plot her escape. Um, did you spoil any work with her at all? or <laughs> Don't spoil anything. No spoilers here, buddy. <laughs> did you get a chance to meet her on set? Oh no, didn't it didn't as much as we did get to meet quite a few of the other actors who were not sharing the screen with. Uh, I never got a chance to meet her now. Awesome. Or what's his name? Uh, Grammar Wormtongue. I always call him Grammar Wormtongue, but obviously the voice of Chucky. Um, Brad Dorif. Yes, Brad. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> it's like great. I'm known as Grammar Wormtongue. Um, yeah, I never got to meet him either. And I was very excited too, but it never happened. So, yeah, because from what it sounds like, you know, everything sort of gets shot and then he records his scenes afterwards, or is it? Opposite? I don't know. I don't know how that works. So they, they actually mentioned that he might come up at some point, and I didn't want to be that guy and say, well, can I be here when he, when he is? But, uh, I would have liked to have been for sure. I would have liked to have had some lunch with him. I've kind of had, I've had lunch with some really, cool people by just doing that very thing overstepping probably but uh, at the end of the day i, I did it and i uh, got to have lunch and, sh and shoot the breeze and it's kind of when you're on set it's the only time that because once you step you're either in the makeup uh the makeup trailer and sometimes people are learning lines so you don't want to disturb anybody so then maybe at lunch if they don't go back you can say hey you want to grab you want to grab a bite and we can uh shoot the shit and then, uh, and sometimes they do. Sometimes they're like, ah, I'm just gonna go back to the trailer. No problem. But uh, yeah, anyway, all that to say, if he uh, if he had shown up, I would have like, I would have definitely loved to pick his brain. He's such an amazing actor. From Deadwood yeah. to the Lord of the Rings series and so on and so forth. From Exorcist 3, I believe he was in. With George C. Scott. George C. Scott. There you go. Yeah, believe it or not, I mean, I've... Um... Because I did just watch the uh, the new Exorcist, I believe it's Believer, the new one that just came out. And um, prior to that, um, I had never from beginning to end watched Exorcist 3. It was always bits and clips whenever it was on TV. You know, I'd watch the second half or the first half. So I rewatched it from beginning to end because a lot of people were saying like, this one holds up and this one's almost as good. The first is in its own category and just... George C. Scott was amazing in that film. And then same with Brad Dorif. Like it was that that's another one that I don't think he gets enough credit for from a horror standpoint is his performance in Exorcist 3. Yeah, I mean, and yeah, for sure. And it, he didn't have like a, I mean, he had a big role, but as far as time on the, on the, on the screen, it was limited. Yeah, yeah. No matter what, he owned it and he, and he, and he crushed it. Um Remember, was he, he was in Dune, right? The first Dune movie, wasn't he? I, I believe so. I believe so. Was he in Dune? I think Could be so. totally way off, but it really looks like him. Um, what was yeah. Sure? Well, look, I'm going to look it up right now. Let's see. <laughs> Continue. Yes, he, he was. He was. Yep. Yeah, he yeah. was. 1984. What a movie to be a part of. Like... Peter DeVries. It still holds its own. We're going down memory lane here, man. 
Yep. And again, like for me, like, you know, the, the stuff from the seventies and eighties and nineties, I mean, that's the stuff that I, I, I grew up with and, and loved watching like never ending story. You know what I mean? Like those. Yeah, awesome. a trail. yeah of course. A trail. <laughs> yeah. um, Every kid's dream, have a sick day and go read in the attic and the book comes to life. It was a, we used to watch that in school, like on a snow day up here, we would get snow days mm -hmm. where half the kids would, not come into class they didn't want the kids to get ahead of everybody so they pile us in the library and we would watch the never-ending story on laser disc and it wasn't there wasn't even tapes back then that's how old i am yep. oh. and and one last thing that i wanted to, to touch on because we did get a teaser for the second half of the chucky series and one thing that was very quick that was shown but you know with fans you know they screenshot and make sure that you see we do see a still image of Brad Dorif um, as a teaser for the second half, right? So I know we can't uh, talk too much into what that entails, but, you know, hopefully, hopefully we can maybe see uh, Charles Lee Ray back in human form or if Brad Dorif is going to be playing a different character. But that's what I'm most excited about seeing next uh, second well, half. Let's see what happens. <laughs> I I do, I do want to touch on some of your upcoming projects that you have as well, right? Um, you were in uh, the uh, the My Spy film, right, with Batista, your co-star from Riddick. Um, and um, as we did find out that the sequel is also, um, I believe, is it already in pre-production? Oh, we, we uh, it's post now. Oh, it's already filmed. It's already filmed. Yeah, we shot it. Yeah, we were in, uh, we, we shot in Cape Town, South Africa, <laughs> which doubled for Rome. Um, Rome is that expensive that it was it was cheaper to fly everybody to South Africa, build a set outside uh, for the external shots of of um, the Vatican. and and then we did go to Rome and we did some other sh stuff that was really quick. But anyway, yeah, it, it's that's that's gonna be uh, one. We'll see when when it comes out. They've invited me uh, down for the red carpet. So we'll see when that is. I have no idea. Amazing. And any uh, fun stories you could share from set working with uh, Dave Batista? What's he like? Yeah, on Dave's, Dave's a hard worker. So it's, you get the, again, he, he had so much and so involvement. I'm sure he was producing on, on this. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure he was producing too. So um, he's a hard worker. He's dedicated. He's disciplined. So you get these little windows where you get to, you know, share time with him. He he had this beautiful house that he had rented, invited us all up, and I got to sit and have a drink with him. Um, and then I I came in as he was prepping for a scene when they just flew in, and I came in and I gave him a big hug. He's so amazing. Like I can't tell you what how great a guy he is, and he's still that same guy that would travel the subway with me to uh, TriStar Gym in Montreal when we were on Riddick and training together. Um, and he, this, sorry, this, so this was on the first, uh, the first My Spy when we hooked up. I had just had, uh, had surgery because I do MMA, martial arts, all that sort of stuff. And I was getting a lot of cauliflower in my ears. And, and I took an ax kick one day, the guy, an ax kick brings his leg up and brings it down the side of my face and hit this ear. And oh, this wow. ear, all the cartilage just it went floppy i, I looked like shrek oh wow so <laughs> I, I was like oh shit i had to get, get my ears fixed oh wow so this ear fixed this ear fixed they pinned them both back and the first thing like when i came on to set for my spy dave dave looks at me he goes dude you fixed your ears <laughs> i said man i went home for christmas and my brother didn't even notice Wow. You like it's the first thing you saw right away. He goes, Yeah, man, you look too pretty. <laughs> but yeah, I couldn't I couldn't be walking around as an actor. And it was I've I've obviously it, uh, taken a step back. I still train all the time, but it's way less aggressive. You know, I'm I'm getting up there too. Um, but I was grinding it out and so on and so forth. And this is getting bad anyway, so on and so forth. Yeah, gotta be careful, man. <laughs> yeah, Deb, because like with with your um, 
you know, uh, uh, roles that you take on, right? I mean, you do such a wide variety of roles where sometimes with the cauliflower ear, right, it, it probably wouldn't be ideal. Like, for example, Randy Couture, right? It doesn't matter what movie he's in, like in Expendables, the last one, they zoom in on the cauliflower. They want you to see it. It's part of the yeah, that's, character, yeah, right? Yeah, that's, that's, you know, uh, what is it? Paul Newman had his blue eyes. Yep, yep. Made him distinct, the beautiful face. Yeah, Randy Couture has <laughs> the cauliflower ear. I mean, it's, we get a lot more range out of the blue eyes than you can <laughs> the cauliflower ear. Um, yeah, so it, it's, and it is all about that range. I don't just want to play the, even though I train martial arts and do all that sort of stuff, like I love, I love comedy. And this is the cool thing about My Spy. That that character is such a, a it strays. I mean, watch the movie. It's very different from what I normally play. Mm -hmm. And I, I always love, uh, picking the brains of the uh, the actor actresses that we have on our uh, podcast. When you guys are not working, what are you guys binge watching at home? Who, what are you guys watching when you're not working at home? I just watched, um, which I thought was a great series, the uh, um, the Fall of the House of Usher. Oh yeah, I haven't seen it, but that one was like a top one and is getting a lot of uh, good. Actually, a buddy of mine saw said it was awesome. You you liked it? Loved it. So I was, it's so great too, because I didn't realize it until I started watching it. I was, uh, I was down in, in, in La La Land pitching a, a project that I had developed with my writing partner, Adam, uh, Adam G. Simon, who wrote Man Down, uh, uh, wrote uh, Point Blank. Do you know those movies? Yes. Man Down, Brian LaBeouf and Gary Oldman. Yep. Adam's got this great story to tell you. You should have him on. Your I'd podcast. love to. Yeah, I'll, and uh, he would do it at the drop of a dime. I'd love uh, But we were down pitching our show, and when we pitched our show, which I can't really get into the details, um, somebody said, oh, this kind of reminds me of a project that we 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 just heard a pitch to about Edgar Allan Poe and, and, and so on and so forth. And uh, when I watched, and they went into the details about that show, and as I'm watching the show, I was like, holy shit, this is the show that they were talking about when we were pitching a few years ago. It's so great. And it was so amazing. Bruce Greenwood's in it. Um, yep. Mary McDonald from uh, uh, Dances with Wolves and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. She's in it as well. And the, the acting superb. Yeah, it's a great show. You got to check it out. It's on Netflix. Yep. Yep. No, it's it's definitely on my list. And, and definitely now, since it's got the stamp of approval from you, I'm going to watch it as well. Well, too. my mother's stamp of approval, too, which oh, she's, yeah, a, sure. she's a bigger critic than me. <laughs> yeah, because to be honest, I, I haven't I'm not as locked in. There's not a show right now that I'm like having to rush to my TV just to binge watch. So, um, you know, that one, we got the stamp of approval. I'm going to definitely put that on the, uh, the list. And You're going to laugh at me. So some of my favorite stuff that I love to watch, because even with a, sh a, a show like The House of the Fall of Usher, I will watch it. And it's really hard for me to get lost in the movie of it, right? Because I'm always thinking, oh, that's a great shot. Oh, that's so cool. Look at that dolly. Look at the pole. Look at what the cameraman did. Look what the actor did. You know, I wonder if the other actor is there or if they're delivering that monologue to yeah. just somebody else, some AD, you know, you never know. I, all those thoughts pour into my mind. Yeah, yeah. Unless yeah. I'm watching animation. If I'm watching animation, I, I I get completely immersed in in what I'm watching. So there's a great show on Prime called Invincible. Have you have you watched that at all? No, no, but I've seen it. Though I see oh, it. it's on my recommended dude, list. Dude, you gotta watch it. It's so great, and it's that superhero genre, but it's that sort of adult superhero genre. Mm -hmm. And then there's another thing on Prime, which is even better for me because I'm a big nerd, obviously, uh, <laughs> uh, called Vox Machina. Vox and Machina, yep. Vox Machina. And it's like Dungeons and Dragons with swearing. And I just get lost and I love it. And I just I just sit there and watch it. It's, uh, I, I just, I'm a kid again. You know what I mean? Kid eating his cereal, watching cartoons, getting lost in the in the business. It's so neat. I love it. I love it. These are all going to be on my list. And I, I do want to also um, be respectful of your time, but I did want to ask, even though you're in 
Canada, but you lived in the States for a while. Do you still celebrate Thanksgiving or do you guys have any plans for the end of the week or? Oh, I do. I uh, We do both here because okay. I have, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> we, uh, we, so we have our Thanksgiving early October mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and we usually get together with the family for that and so on and so forth. And then uh, come this Thanksgiving, any American friends of mine who are up in town, we celebrate Thanksgiving for them. That's amazing. Are you hosting? Sometimes I've hosted for them because, you know, they're at their uh, at their apartments where they're in town shooting or so on and so forth. And then they'll come over and we'll host a little bit of a Thanksgiving for them, an American Thanksgiving. Amazing. And then we go online and we shop for Black Friday. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what it's uh, like, right? They're now with the stores, they're starting the Black Friday sales earlier. So if you're going in store, you're seeing some of those deals. But yeah, all my Black Friday shopping is is all done uh, online uh, nowadays. And in a previous life, I used to come from the retail world and I just, I can't, you know, put myself through that torment of going through the rush of Black Friday in person. You, uh, although I have braved it a couple of times in places and you get there early and there's still the lineups out the door and so on and so forth. Yeah, it's crazy. Definitely, definitely. Um, no, I had a blast. This session's amazing. I feel like I made a, a new friend. Um, I definitely want to uh, save some, like I always use this as save some room for round two. Maybe when they sure, let's do it, man. Zaya, yeah. it's been a real pleasure. I'm, I'm, we, I feel like we could talk for hours and hours about movies and people would maybe not pay attention to it. But, <laughs> <laughs> but no, yeah, no. it's always, it's always nice to to meet somebody who just loves, loves the production, the the film world as much as I do. I appreciate it and love hearing it, you know, firsthand, you know, from your perspective, you know, you're, you're in the trenches, you know, so to speak as well. So definitely when uh, the sequel to My Spy comes out or when the second half of Chucky comes out and hopefully we could see the uh, return of Teddy in some capacity, we're definitely going to try to reel you back in for, uh, for round two, but thank you for making the time to, uh, to meet and, and can't wait to share with the fans. Cool, Zan. Take care, buddy. Thank you very much, man. I appreciate it. Thank you very much as well. Take care. Dude.